Good day, folks. It's uh, good to be here with you again. Uh, another week has gone by as we move further, further into uh, October. And before we know it, it'll be November. This is kind of how it happens, doesn't it? It just moves along. Um, I just, I'm glad that you're with, uh, with me and thank you for inviting me into your places. As we continue in the journey together uh, in the sermon series, a study of First Peter, uh, we've been on for a few months now and continue to do so as we now enter chapter 4. So please turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 as we begin uh, our study of that chapter. Now, C.S. Lewis, speaking into the 19th century culture, said this, quote, A sign of a culture that had lost its faith is moral collapse upon spiritual collapse. Notice what Lewis said here, folks. More collapse is preceded by spiritual collapse. First there is spiritual collapse, and then moral collapse follows. Of course, Lewis was addressing his 19th century cultural context. But what's important for us today is to realize that Lewis recognized the impact of spiritual collapse on Western civilization, which we are part of even this day. Lewis's observation continues to be proved out in our day. The moral bankruptcy of Western civilization continues in its downward spiral. This begs a question, and there are many questions we could ask, but the one that I want to sort of highlight for us today is, how then has our culture impacted the church? Well, this is a huge question. It's a huge question that would require plenty of comprehensive work and understanding of what makes a civilization, what breaks a civilization, and the impact of civilization on the church. And time is not our friend today, so we need to sort of uh, appropriate someone else's ideas here just for some introductory comments. And I found an article by Daryl Dash, which he called Resist Cultural Values. And Daryl contends that the Western church today, the church that we are part of, is, quote, tempted to mimic the surrounding cultures, values, and practices. And in that article, Daryl highlights three current cultural values that he sees that have impacted the church today. Now, of course, we can recognize some of these uh, values that he has here in our culture, and one of them is authenticity. Authenticity. Now, I don't think this, uh, Daryl, means it this way, that we might think it is. And he would say that this is appropriately described, and I'll just use this expression that I've, I found myself. He, he would describe this kind of value as the culture, uh, the cultural value of you be you, you be you. You might have heard that. Someone even have told you that, you be you. And according to Daryl's uh, thesis, many Christians today look within themselves, you know, into their feelings, into their sensitivities, their intuitions to guide them in even their spiritual lives. Now, another term that uh, is common in this uh, phenomenon in the church today that we've actually explored a, a number of weeks back is expressive individualism. And I think the anthem of this cultural value is simply this, uh, I did it my way, I did it my way. And, or as Daryl put it, uh, don't let anyone question your right to be you. And of course we see this cultural value uh, in countless places in our culture, uh, certainly in the bookstores, even Christian bookstores, all plenty of self-help books are there for one to develop you, uh, or develop me, myself, and I, if you will. And the theme obviously is found in Hollywood movies. And certainly if you pay attention to what Disney's producing, uh, we see this cultural value uh, exuded there in their movies and their programming. My friends today, churches have many people who live by this cultural value. And when you consider the word of God, it really calls the Christian, the believer, really not to look within themselves, but outside of themselves. To look to an objective reality. What might that be? Well, it's God and his commandments as revealed in his word. 
You know, it's interesting when we think of this UBU, cultural value, one of the offshoots, or if you will, or one of the uh, consequences of this kind of va uh, cultural value is another one that we can express this way. No one can tell me what to do. You ever, ever hear someone say that to you? No one can tell me what to do, or you can't tell me what to do. It certainly is a cultural value of our day. For, our, for it is our right, according to our culture and responsibility, to stand against those who trespass against our personal freedoms, our autonomy. Therefore, anyone who claims any sort of authority over us, or over, over you or me, I should say, is making some sort of power play, some sort of power play on our lives, and, and, and this must be resisted. Of course, again, the witness of God's word reveals that we are all under authority. Matter of fact, one day all of us will answer to God one way or another, righteous and the unrighteous. And Christians are called to submit to the commands of God that, he, that uh, we find in his word. We're also uh, called to submit to those authorities God has placed over us, Thinking about ourselves when we were children, our parents' authority over us as we grew and had our first jobs, our bosses, if you will, their authority over us. Of course, the government who is uh, supposed to and is designed by God to punish evildoers and to, um, you know, lift up the people that do good, to flourish, make them flourish. And of course, also church leaders, we have those over us too. Well, we have the first cultural value that uh, Daryl mentioned, UBU. We have the next one, no one tells me what to do. Well, there's a third piece. Our culture, and this makes sense, I think, if you think about it, values maximum happiness. Maximum happiness and avoidance of suffering. It's best, it's best expressed in this expression, I think, do what makes you happy. And of course, if anything doesn't make you happy, well, stop doing that. Because it's unfair and wrong to expect anyone to suffer in our culture, say for that relationship, that marriage, or work space that causes us emotional pain. Again, uh, we, can, we can know for sure that the Word of God speaks directly to this cultural value. Suffering in this world is unavoidable. You see, suffering, my friends, is an equal opportunity employer. The unrighteous suffer as well as the righteous. Blessings are given that way too. Blessing, blessings are for the good and the bad. But back to this idea of suffering. We have seen the Apostle Peter here, who has reminded us over the past number of months that Christians are called to suffer for the good news of Christ. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be surprised when suffering comes our way for our faith in Christ. Darrell summarizes for us. He said, quote, Many in our churches believe they must be themselves, question authority, and avoid suffering. And I would agree with his next statement. These ideas are dangerous to those people, and they do rob us of our joy and dishonor. So let's be reading together chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verses 1 through to. Let's read right down to the end of verse, let's see, uh, 11, verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Verse 3, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lavish idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. 
Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, I thank you. Uh, Father, I just commit myself to you. You know these past weeks have been, uh, well, they've been difficult in my own life and uh, the lives of many others around uh, our ministry here. Uh, we just ask, Lord, in those days and these days to help us through all this moment and help me, Lord, to set me aside. And Holy Spirit of living God, lead me in this sermon. May we receive the words that we hear today deep into our hearts and may it move our hands and feet to glorify you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So our focus uh, today is going to be verses 1 to 6 here in chapter 4. And as we, we look at this text, we, we want to bring with us the Apostle Peter's teaching on Christian suffering and Christian, the Christian's hope that we discovered from chapter 1 as we began in there right through to our text today. It's important to note, uh, as we, we think about these six verses, that the suffering his audience experienced was because of their faith and trust in Christ. We said this over and over. Uh, and that's important to remember, though. And the apostle had reminded his audience, as he reminds us today, that their faith and hope was not of their own doing. Uh, we go back to chapter 1, verse 3, where Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this living hope is being kept for the believer in heaven. That's verse 4 of chapter 1. Friends, this is no pie in the sky kind of hope. This is no hope so hope. See, their faith was a living hope. A real hope and a real faith in a real person called Jesus Christ. For God the Father sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, into a real history to real people with a real result. It was a living hope, a living faith because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's all in chapter 1, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. Well, this in mind, let's read verse 1 again here in chapter 1 together. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That's verse 1. I want to deal with this phrase translated by the ESV, which I've been using for a long time now, since therefore Christ, and particularly this phrase, since therefore. Now that's a direct, really a, just a word-for-word -word translation from the original language, the Greek. And if we were to literally translate the Greek here, we would say it this way, since Christ, therefore. Other translations uh, smooth out this wooden sense and translate this, uh, the original language as therefore since Christ. I think that's in the NIV and some others too. But here's the point. The conjunction here, the therefore, challenges the reader to know what the Apostle Peter had said before the therefore. We need to know what he said before. And I hope you've been tracking with chapter 1, 2, and 3 and Peter's thought process and teaching through there. So the principle is clear because when we study the biblical text, we first read the context and then we go back over the text for our understanding and knowledge. And what happens is this prevents us from reading ourselves into the text because these, this letter was not written to you and me. It was written to a first century audience. It was written for us, but not directly to us. And we don't want to read ourselves into the text, even though we can have some principles and teaching that come from it. It also helps you and me from misunderstanding the author's thought process and thereby it helps us from saying things about God that are not true of God or even his word. So I want to practice that principle. So from a bird's eye view of chapter 1 to 3, what we've done so far, what we've discovered is the apostle had highlighted that these first century believers were suffering for their faith in Christ. We've said that multiple times. It's always good to be reminded. And, pers and persecution may come to the believer even for their good works. Yet again, the Apostle Peter had reminded right from the beginning that there, uh, his audience had a great hope in the resurrected Christ. 
And this hope was something for them to rejoice about, as it is for us. He would say, though, now for a little while, if it is necessary, you're, you have been grieved by various trials, but you've rejoiced in your salvation nevertheless. Notice how the Apostle Peter bought, brought his audience from in these uh, initial chapters, 1 to 3, back to Christ, back to Christ and that great salvation they had received. We go back to chapter 1, verse 13. Peter there said, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So in the trials that you are facing, he was saying, prepare your minds for action. Do not be conformed to your former passions of your former ignorance. But be holy in all your conduct, for your God is holy. We're talking about verse 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 in chapter 1 there. And when you face trials, conduct yourselves with fear. Why is that, Peter? Well, for your Father in heaven will judge everyone impartially according to each one's deeds. That's again verse 17, chapter 1. The apostle continues right into chapter 2. He would say as a holy people, grow up into your salvation. Chapter 2, verse 2. Come to him. Come to who? Christ, who, uh, where Peter describes as a living stone in verse 4 of chapter 2. And as you face your persecutors, remember your, Peter would say, like living stones as well, built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. There he's bringing people back to Christ. That's chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. He also said, remember who you are in the sight of God. He said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people called out of darkness into its marvelous light. That's chapter 2, verse 9. The apostle continued. He said, as God's people, as God's people, be subject to those God has put over you. He said, be subject to every human institution, chapter 2, verse 13. And then he said to servants, those are even slaves in those days, be subject to your masters with all respect, chapter 2, verse 15, and even to those who are unjust. And then he would say, if you suffer for doing good, remember this. He would say, it is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow his steps. He said, look to Christ. Always look to Christ. Christ did not sin. Christ was not deceitful. Christ did not return insult for insult when he suffered. Christ trusted his Father in heaven. So Peter is saying here, do likewise. As Christ submitted to his Father in heaven, submit to God, to each other, and to those in authority over the believers. Over and over, the Apostle Peter brought his audience back to Christ back to Christ. And again, we find this at the beginning here of chapter 4. We've read verse 1. And this should bring uh, to mind what we talked about last week in verse 13, uh, verse 3, uh, chapter 3, pardon me, verse 18, where Peter said, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Friends, as Christ suffered for the sins of the believer, he goes on to say, arm yourselves the same, with the same way of thinking here in verse 1. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. What way of thinking? Well, we can say this another way. The same attitude or the same purpose. The same attitude is what you'll find in the NIV. The same purpose you'll find in the NAS, NASB. And this phrase, arm yourself, means to be prepared. To be prepared. And here's the point, my friends. Christians should be prepared to have the same attitude in their sufferings as Jesus had. Of course, this brings up the question, what attitude did Christ have? Well, let's take a look a little bit deeper into this uh, question or answer, find the answer to this question. We can go to Matthew's Gospel. And Matthew there records for us a transition in the earthly ministry of Jesus. We go to Matthew chapter 16. And we see there, as Jesus was getting closer to his, to his passion, the Passion Week, he would focus then uh, primarily the rest of his time on preparing his disciples. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, uh, Matthew records this. 
Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So what attitude did Christ have towards suffering? Well, you see, friends, Jesus understood that suffering was built into the very purpose on why he was sent to the earth. This is a, a purpose that was prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before. We find Isaiah foretelling of the Messiah who, was, who uh, uh, was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, 3. See, Jesus was not surprised when trials and tribulations came his way. He was prepared and he expected suffering. Now you might say, well, pastor, pastor, that's Jesus. I'm not Jesus. His mission, his purpose was to suffer and die for the sin of the world. Well, I'd have to say, yes, that's true. But, 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 what are you going to do with what Jesus said about believers and their suffering? We go to John chapter 15. You can turn there if you want. I'll try to slow down a little bit here. John chapter 15, verse 18 to 23. Uh, there Jesus is preparing his disciples uh, uh, to, for his soon-to-be arrest and then crucifixion, and he said to them, and he's speaking to us as well today through his word, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love you as it is own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Then he would go on to say this, All these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. And then he would say another thing that's very interesting. He would say, Whoever hates me hates my father also. Well, the Apostle Peter reminded his audience, and he reminds us here in chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange was, were happening to you. Yes, you're right. You and I are not Jesus. Yes, however, believers will be persecuted for their faith in Christ. And you know what, really, friends, you think about the current popular evangelical context, church of today. The church today needs to stop dating the culture. It really does and needs to arm itself with a Christ-like attitude. Well, much more could be said about these, these initial verses in chapter 4, but our prayer, I hope, would be like that of King David, who once prayed, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. May that be the prayer of our heart in these days. May we repent of our you be you attitude. May we discard, toss away, throw away, no one can tell me what to do attitude. May each one of us have a Christ-like attitude. Well, we want to move along. We, we look now at verse 2 and 3. We'll take those together. These two verses, as you look at them, uh, I think if you think about them a little bit, it can be somewhat confusing if we forget the context. You know, we have these phrases here in verse 1, for example, cease from sin, and we have uh, in verse 3, the time that is past suffices. These can provide some good clues for us. So we ask, what is the apostle getting at here in these verses? Well, keeping the context, uh, I hope you remember that, what it is, front and center, we can reason that when, when a believer finds themselves suffering like Christ, they are less prone to indulge in sin. Now, this is not suggesting the believer is sinless. But when a believer has made up their mind to follow Christ and that they set their course on their lives away from the comfort and pleasures of sin, well, they will not indulge in sin, of course. Believers then will be ready to be confronted, uh, be ready with their minds, be ready in their minds, be prepared in their minds to be confronted with trials and tribulations for the cause of Christ. The Apostle Paul in his Roman letter uh, said this of this particular situation. 
What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And further on in verse 12 and 13 of the same chapter 6, he said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Well, now we've arrived, verse 4 and 5. And so Peter went from instru- has gone from instructing the believers to have a Christ-like attitude toward persecution. And then having made up their choice to live their lives for the will of God and willing to suffer for that life, he now transitions and he says, believers no longer seek the pleasure and comfort that unbelievers seek. And what do they seek? Well, he gives us a little list here in verse 3. They seek sensuality, they they seek passion, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry, verse 3. And what we need to understand here is that the Apostle Peter has uncovered for us another dimension to suffering for Christ. And we we see this in verse 4 when he said, with respect to this, they are surprised when you not join them in their drunkenness, their orgies, their drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. idolatry. You, they, you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and then they malign you, verse 4. Apostle Peter had already reminded his audience that their good works for the cause of Christ would be noticed back in chapter 3. And sometimes that good conduct and good works for Christ might win some over to Christ. We saw that in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, and the unbelieving husband. However, when a believer sets their mind on Christ and does not indulge in a sinful lifestyle, this often can provoke unbelievers who live for pleasure. And then they would be surprised when you do not join them. The unbeliever seeking pleasure then is insulted. Some are insulted by believer's choice not to participate in their reckless lifestyles. Some would even become resentful and will malign the believer. The Greek used here, translated by the ESV, malign carries the sense to slander or to charge falsely or with malicious intent. The NIV translates it this way, they heap abuse on you. Remember back when the Apostle Peter said in chapter 1, as children, obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. That's chapter 1, verse 15. And then in chapter 2, Peter said, you are a holy nation. That's verse 9. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, God purposed in eternity past for us, for the world, I should say, to see Christ in his people. We are to reveal Christ to the world that his people would proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us, what? Called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Chapter 2, verse 9. And my friends, when you and I and when believers from the first century to this day are slandered and charged falsely for refusing to join in the unbelieving world's sinful conduct, the first century believers and you and me today are reminded that a day is coming, as Peter put it, that they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Verse 5. So the question is, what do we do in the meantime? What do we do when persecution does come our way for our faith in Christ? Well, we need to remember some things. We need to remember what our unbelieving family and friends and world need the most of from us. They need us to submit to God. They need us to submit our lives to God, to his will and purpose in those good times, bad times, ugly times. To trust the Holy Spirit, fully trust the Holy Spirit, trust the Holy Spirit's power, trust the Holy Spirit's wisdom, not our own in those times. And boldly, boldly share the good news of Jesus Christ. If you are persecuted for your faith in Christ, that is the time when you have the voice to share the good news of Christ, the unfiltered and powerful gospel. Apostle Paul reminds us that the gospel is powerful for salvation to Jew and Gentile. Dear friends, 
We have no time to waste. Our friends, our unbelieving friends, our unbelieving family, our unbelieving world near need to hear the good news of the gospel, what has changed us forever into eternity. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. God, would you just take all this? Would you just filter out any, any of my sort of stumbling and fumbling and mumbling, which there was plenty of it tonight. And may those that have heard this message, may they take it to heart. And may you change them, may you mold them, may you shape them to be more like your son. And those who are not Christian, that actually even come to the end of this and hear this prayer, I pray, God, that they would turn to you and ask for your forgiveness. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take care, folks. God bless. Shalom.